Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. Lebanon is in the midst of a multi-year economic crisis, which is simultaneously a political crisis. The economic relief that international donors have offered is conditioned on economic and political reforms that Lebanese politicians have been unwilling to make so far. This week on Babel, I'm joined by Hanin Sayed, who recently left the World Bank after a 25-year career. We talk about Lebanon's economic crisis, why Lebanese politicians treat this as business as usual, and how the international community can start to offer relief to the Lebanese public. Then I continue the conversation with Will Todman and Marty Pimentel, a new member of the Middle East program. We break down Lebanon's sectarian politics and how legacies from the Lebanese Civil War help shape today's economic and political crisis. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Hanin Sayed is a human development specialist living in Lebanon. Previously, she was a lead specialist at the World Bank, working on human development and social protection in the Middle East and North Africa. Hanin, welcome to Babel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The World Bank recently said that the economic crisis in Lebanon may be one of the three worst economic crises in the world in the last 150 years. Can you just help us capture what life in Lebanon was like in 2019 before the crisis started and what it's like now? Now, in 2019, it's erroneous to say that everything was rosy. There was growth. There had been economic growth in Lebanon for some time. But let's not forget that in 2011, there was the eruption of the Syrian conflict, which impacted Lebanon hugely. Of course, one area of impact was the influx of almost a million and a half refugees into Lebanon, a population itself of only four million The Syrian conflict erupted trade and foreign direct investment into Lebanon, so growth actually plummeted. And already in 2019, the country was experiencing negative growth. People were feeling it. Inflation was beginning to rise. So that triggered a reaction from populists and people went onto the street. But really, it was also a huge outpouring against the political situation. And that then brought on the economic and financial crises. So we are now talking about three or four years of a deep economic crises. Now, as you know, we don't have a president. We don't have a governor of central bank. We have a caretaker government. The internal security position is also vacant. And soon the head of the army tenure will be over. And none of these can come into place until you start with the main election, which is the president, and then you can cascade down to the other key positions. And until that happens, none of these reforms are going to be able to be take place. And what's happening in the meantime, of course, is the population is being impoverished, basic services are not being provided. We're talking about education, we're talking about health, electricity, which has been an entire fiasco in Lebanon for decades. And the public sector has collapsed, entirely collapsed. GDP has been cut by probably 40% by now. The Lebanese pound has lost almost 90% of its value. Inflation is extremely high. When Europe talks about 5 or 6 or 10% inflation, that's very alarming. Well, we had last year food inflation over 300%. And you mentioned that there's a political aspect to it. I think the way I studied political science in college, there was a sense that in certainly a system where you have elections, when things get bad, people throw out the current political leadership and bring in new political leadership. And yet, it seems that not only have elections not changed the political situation, the economic situation in Lebanon, but there also hasn't been pressure outside of the electoral process. People haven't taken to the streets in large numbers. They haven't disrupted life because life now is intolerable. People seem to be hunkering down. And I think for many of us, It's puzzling that a system where there's free expression and a lot of political freedoms, that there hasn't been accompanying political change to this really dislocating economic environment. 
No, that's very important observation. And I think even for us living through it, and I have been living here for the past more than 15 years and have lived through the multiple crises, sometimes it is hard to understand why there isn't this real revolution out on the street. So there was mass oppressed and a lot of people in the street in 2019 and some extent 2020, but essentially it got crushed by force. And Lebanon, while I mean, people outside perceive it as a democracy, and to some extent there are elements of a democratic state, including free speech and the like, but it's a fractured political situation. There's no one particular leader where people can go after, like what happened in the rest of the Arab world during the Arab Spring. There are multiple political heads, warlords from the relic of the civil war, who continue to be in power. So it is not easy to make change. And why did people vote everybody back in. I think by that time, which were these were elections that happened in Parliament a year ago, people were also tired. They tried. They didn't see the impact, the change. There was also a failure of political parties and alternatives to come up with a new vision, with a new leadership that could lead the country out of where it was. So There's a lot of fragmentation in the political system. And I think, of course, you have a highly confessional setup also in Lebanon, which does not make it easy. So I think people react in a way where they're afraid. What you know now is better than the unknown and maybe fearing that the whole place will collapse. But because there wasn't an alternative, there wasn't a credible, large enough alternative which people can vote for. Lebanon also had a long and grueling civil war for about 15 years. To what extent are memories of the war the lingering effects of the war, leading Lebanese to say, but change doesn't work either. The same way that, to some extent, we see the memory of the Arab Spring inhibiting people in other countries from trying to change their government because they say the last time we tried to change the government, either it devolved into chaos like you have in Syria and Yemen and Libya, or the same guys are back in power. They're just more repressive. Is there a fear in Lebanon that if you push it too far, it could tip into war again? Yes, that fear is always there. It's not even a long ago memory. It's very recent. I mean, as we speak, there are things happening on the border in the south and the north. And so the Lebanese are always wary of the stability and the security situation in the country. And this, I think, does play a factor. I mean, there's always this Lebanese reach to the brink and then there's a pullback because we don't want to fall into that abyss. But unfortunately, that means that really fundamental change is very hard to come by. Many people in Lebanon, many groups believe that the system has to entirely collapse to be able to rebuild something new. So that's in some where things are. <laughs> so you have the international donor community, which includes the World Bank, the IMF, the United States, France, potentially the Gulf countries, I think fairly united on trying to extract a certain number of changes from Lebanon in exchange for financial assistance. Lebanon has not made the changes. The financial assistance has not yet come. Do you expect that this is going to reach a breaking point, that the Lebanese system will feel it has to change to secure this aid? Or do you think this is just able to stumble along? Sort of using the word resilience here in a negative way. It has this capacity to just keep going and for the political parties and the political heads to make deals. Because in the past, whether it be Paris 1, Paris 2, Paris 3, these have been the big conferences where Lebanon has gone for financial aid from the international community conditioned on reform. So they got the money, but they didn't do the reform. So I think the international community now is tired and saying, well, you know, you really have to show the reform before we give you the money. And that has been the call of the international community for the past two years. So this can continue for a while, unfortunately, this deterioration and this stubbornness, if you will, of the system to even yield to international pressure. I think they can still hold on for a little bit. And what's happening, of course, is that you have the seasonal influx of tourists and especially diaspora, Lebanese coming in. Now in the summer, if you're looking at social media, you'll think I'm crazy because social media, look at Lebanon, people are partying and dancing and restaurants are full and beaches are among the most beautiful in the world. So Lebanese come back to their homes. They're very dedicated. They have been for generations. They want to come and contribute and see their families. And so you have this spike of activity and economic action. And there really is some of that. 
But that's obviously one side, and this is temporary. You know, come end of this month, in a couple of weeks, this all goes away and everything goes back to the misery, really, that it fundamentally is. And so the politicians think that they can live and buy time. They've always been living by trying to buy time. Kick the can down as far as you can, buy some time, something will happen. So, for example, when the Ukraine-Russia war broke out, and this impacted globally fuel and food prices and fertilizer, and of course Lebanon being a large importer of wheat, in particular from Ukraine specifically, was impacted. So, of course, they ran to international community to help. So you'll get these external events that sometimes I think the Lebanese wish would happen so that they can say, oh, help us. But, you know, nothing's changing fundamentally. No reforms have been taking place for now years and years. Do you think the international financial institutions have to act differently than they have to try to unstick the economic and political process in Lebanon? I do. And in fact, I have been with a colleague, Ishaq Diwan, been thinking about a new approach, if you will, or renewed approach with the international community. Now, I think there needs to be this continued push, the big push by the international community on the reforms that to get the real big money, you have to do the reforms. But that is not enough. So our view is that this is one leg. We've got to keep pushing on it. But then at the same time, let's try to think of a second leg where we want to help people directly and maybe not even through government, but we want to help them so that in three to five years, when these big reforms happen and the economy really starts to pick up, We have a population which is well-fed, still educated, you know, has basic health care. So this is the second leg of support, which is let us find ways to help people directly and try to say help the institutions that need to be helped. So take education sector. We will help the schools directly. We give them funding through, let's say, a block grant to schools directly. We will help teachers directly. We will help families and their children make sure that the kids go to school and even to university. Take health care. Let's provide as an international community support directly to hospitals, to primary health care, to families or safety net, which which is something I've been working on for some years. We provide the families directly cash assistance. So you provide support directly, and there are ways of doing it, and some of that already is happening. Of course, you'll put some conditions on government because you do not want to get them off the hook entirely. We're not here as the international community to do the government's job. So there will have to be some conditions, but the point is help people directly, get civil society more involved, including in oversight and watchdog type of roles, and It's not a whole lot of money. We're talking about less than a billion dollars a year to be able to provide the needy Lebanese population sufficient health, education, social, and maybe even some livelihood and job. But at least this way, you've kind of protected people for a while. I mean, I know that this might sound like a pure humanitarian approach, but it's actually not. Lebanon gets a lot of humanitarian assistance, but we're talking about now a slightly different focus and working much more through non-state actors and also getting a coherent approach of the international community. The issue we have is a lot of fragmentation of the support. Almost there are many different NGOs and that are receiving money from different donors, doing the different things and so on. So much more coordination, coherence in the support that needs to come. But essentially in some two legs. One is push the big reforms. The other one is support basic services directly to people. It seems to me that one of the things that that would do is it would potentially take money away from the government that it uses for patronage, takes away money from some of these sectarian political leaderships that use the money for patronage. But a lot of the NGOs could be affiliated with those same organizations, those same institutions, and you could deepen the sectarian political divisions in the country. How do you think about that problem that in many ways, the non-governmental sector in Lebanon is as fragmented as the political sector. I mean, you you put your finger on a very fine point. A recent article that I published with Carnegie tries to look at that because Lebanon in a way could be almost special or unique in what we call its social contract. So the typical social contract that we read about for the other Arab countries is that the government provides jobs and the education and health and everything. And the people just 
give the political allegiance to the government. That was sort of the traditional one, whether you had it in Tunisia or Jordan or Egypt, Syria, and so on. So for political, just, you know, keep your mouth shut and we provide you the stuff. But Lebanon never had exact that situation because government wasn't big in providing services. If anything, that social contract was between the people and many of these non-state actors, as you're saying, and the government was get out of the way. So, in fact, what needs to happen is a strengthening of the government and its role in the provision of basic services. Now, you might say that this contradicts what I said earlier about this second leg of the strategy. That second leg, I want to emphasize, really, it's a temporary phase where we need to be working to keep basic services provided to people, doing it in a way where we would still try to build the systems of the institutions, of the government, so that when the time comes, when the big push has happened, you're still working with them. I mean, I'll give you a very concrete example. We tried to establish a social safety net in Lebanon for years, and there were many reasons why the Lebanese governments, consecutive governments, just didn't take it very seriously, although there was very obvious there was need for that. But when the financial economic crisis happened in 2019 and got really into 2020, the government got convinced that they need to have a big safety net program, one that provides at least a quarter of the population a uh, cash transfer, direct cash transfer, just to be able to arrest the poverty. But how did we do that? Finally, when we succeeded, yes, we're providing people directly, but then we automated the entire process. So from the application process or registration, people, you know, go onto their iPhone or laptop and register, put their information in, they put in their ID, and then the process assessment to payment has been digitized. And no government, nobody can interfere with that. So we didn't entirely preclude government in this because in the end, these systems belong to the government. They run them, the Ministry of Social Affairs, but it's digitized and you can put a lot of controls monitoring that. So you can think of ways like this. Similarly, on the education sector, already doing it, providing teachers directly the support they need, block grants to school. So this doesn't mean Ministry of Education doesn't have a role, but it is, again, a process and mechanisms that will reduce the amount of leverage they have in terms of potential for corruption. Now, one group that has been especially effective and aggressive providing social support is Hezbollah, providing support to the Shia community in parts of Beirut and especially in the south of Lebanon. Are there ways to implement the kinds of changes you're talking about with Hezbollah's agreement, or does it have to be over Hezbollah's objection because they see part of their business model being disrupted by precisely the kind of technocratic system that you're describing? So let me tell you, in this cash transfer program that we implemented, there was full cooperation from all uh, the groups, but including Hezbollah. We actually didn't feel any resistance. So if you're talking about the temporary model, I don't think they would have any objection to it, one which engages civil society in any case. But ultimately, the objective is to build institutions, of course, and to bring in those that are outside into the system. Right now, with the economic situation also affecting the areas of Hezbollah, it's affecting everybody, there is more openness to different approaches because they can't do it alone either. I mean, their main source of funding, the external source of funding coming from Iran is also impacted. And I believe they also see that the pie needs to be bigger and they need to be a part of it. So if they feel that their populace is benefiting, there could be potential for agreeing. I want to end, if we can, on a more positive note. So I was wondering if you could tell me something really exciting and creative a local NGO is doing to help address the economic crisis. I've been struck at just how vigorous the voluntary sector is in Lebanon. What's the most exciting thing you've seen going on there? There's so many, but let me tell you one that I'm also involved in. It's called NAFDA. It's a collective, actually, or a movement. I wouldn't even call it, not a classic NGO, but NAFDA in Arabic means to clean up, to dust off, you know, to kind of rejuvenate. So like what you do with a rug that has dust on it, you do a NAFDA on it. Shake it out. And shake it out. And the idea is to do that to the education system, because as I mentioned earlier, it's an absolute really important area for Lebanon and which we're losing a comparative advantage. So the idea is to mobilize the school principals, eventually all the school principals of the country. We have about a little over 2000 schools. So if you mobilize even half of those or a quarter of those, you already created a movement. Now, what are we mobilizing them to do? We're mobilizing them with 
principles of good governance, of citizenship, of community engagement. So each principle in her or his school are making change. And we've already seen this. This has been now in the making for two years. And there are 60 schools now already, but it's growing, catching like wildfire around the country. And you see that that change is starting to happen. So in a way, it's a grassroots, but something that can be scaled up because a lot of grassroots initiatives just stay at that level. So let's save the education system from the bottom up. Hanin Sayed, thank you so much for joining us on Babel. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. One thing that I was struck by Dr. Sayed's comments was about her idea that Lebanon has this unique social contract with respect to its role for these sectarian non-state actors and service provision in its economy. And I'm curious, why is it that Lebanon has this unique sectarian politics and economics? It partly has to do with the fact that Lebanon was set up to protect a certain religious group who was set up by the French to protect the Maronite Christians. And it inherited an Ottoman system of leaving each sect in charge of civil code. Lebanon has 18 recognized sects, and increasingly the sectarian divisions came to reflect political divisions, economic divisions, And it became embedded, and the sects themselves and these sectarian leaderships ended up capturing the state. And so, in many cases, there are things that we normally associate with this is what the state would provide. And in Lebanon, you get them from sectarian leaders, whether it's Hezbollah assisting with welfare payments, whether it's the Druze providing employment. There's a way in which the sectarian divisions partly reduced the country's politics to math and who has how many people. Of course, there hasn't been a census in Lebanon since 1932. But partly it's about this apportioning. It's not about performance. It's not about accomplishments. It's about representation and protection. And when you're trying to protect the whole society, that often breaks down. And the leaders have focused so much on playing that sectarian game and become very adept in a way at playing it. And I think have not focused on nation building and thinking about building the kinds of national institutions that often we think of as a country has emerged out of conflict. And then, you know, I think we've said this before, ultimately, all of the sectarian leaders are in this together. They want to protect each other to some extent because they know if any of them abandon the system and try and propose a system on different terms, playing according to accountability and transparency and things like that, then they could all lose. And there is no greater manifestation of this than the fact that this completely failing system has endured the third greatest economic collapse in the last 150 years, as the World Bank suggested. So despite all of that, despite all of the pressure, they still would rather maintain the system than accept any reforms that could challenge the status quo. The other piece of this that I think is important is it feels to me when I talk to people involved in Lebanese politics, everybody feels systematically discriminated against. Not only the Shia, who arguably are a plurality of Lebanon citizens at this point, but the Maronites feel they're not getting what they should get, and the Sunnis feel they're not getting what they should get. Everybody feels that the system is full of people who are trying to take away their just desserts, and it creates an entire system infused with a sense of grievance. And I think rather than lubricating the system, it it creates frictions within the system that in many ways embed the individual sectarian leaders, but end up handicapping Lebanon. It seems to me then that there's this sort of paradox that on the one hand, we see this inaction in Lebanon. There's a lack of change. And yet at the same time, there's a real sense of grievance on the part of most people in Lebanon. Do you think that there's a way that international donors or activists in the country can leverage these grievances in a productive way to create change from the status quo. 
one of the challenges is that as soon as you start to undermine a certain group's interests, then they have various tools at their disposal to fight back. We saw this perhaps most starkly in October of 2021. Fighting broke out in the streets of Beirut in Tayune, and it was on one side protesters affiliated with Hezbollah and Amal, and on the other side, they were apparently fired on by partisans from the Lebanese forces. And this came about because Hezbollah was trying to put pressure on the individual who had been appointed to investigate the Beirut port explosion. So this was, I think, a time where Hezbollah and its allies felt under pressure that there might be accountability when it comes to the port explosion and that this could then spill out. And so they then had a really provocative action to march towards a Christian majority area. And then this instantly raised echoes of the civil war. And certainly then that really poured cold water on the demands for accountability. Now, ultimately, when you deal with some of these special interests, you can think of coercing them, you can think of circumventing them, and you can think of co-opting them. And it seems to me that in recent months, members of the international community, including the United States, have lent further towards the coercion side. Certainly sanctions are a big part of this. They've just coordinated sanctions against the former governor of the central bank. Circumvention is another approach, and I think that's what Dr. Syed was in a way proposing by going directly to the people and circumventing the government and the political factions. But also, I think co-opting is a really interesting avenue to pursue, and it's controversial because it involves working with some of these groups themselves. But in Powering Recovery, this was one of the pieces that I tried to look at is how do you co-opt generator owners into a new system and how do you encourage them to use renewables? Now, that's just one example. But I do think that if you provide the right incentives, then there are some ways to co-opt certain actors to try to push them in towards a new system. Now, Will, you mentioned the specter of civil war that emerged with the onset of fighting in these clashes. And I wonder, how does the legacy of civil war and of protest impact the likelihood of broader change, broader protests? People in the Middle East argue that there are civil wars in Syria and Libya and Yemen and arguably an ongoing civil war in Iraq, if you want to call it that. There is this sense in the Middle East that they are currently going through civil wars that have lasted more than a decade. There's a sense in places like Egypt that we pushed to take down a military dictatorship and we still have a military dictatorship. There are certainly a number of Libyans I've spoken to who said that under Gaddafi, at least there was order and now there's nothing. I think as, as people think about their options, there was a sense in 2011 that people said, well, everything's better than the status quo, and we'll have a democracy, and the, and the democracy will deliver. In Tunisia, they had a democracy, and people turned away from the democracy. The democracy wasn't able to deliver. And so in 2011, there was a persistent sense that the grass is always greener. Now, what worries me is a sense the grass is all burned out, and the only way is to leave the Middle East. And the numbers I've seen about the number of young people who want to get out of the Middle East is stark, not only for the countries and the prospect of brain drain, but for the prospect of large-scale emigration to Europe or somewhere else that's not really looking for a lot of immigrants and what kinds of challenges and social problems that might create if you have the alternative hopefulness about revolution being just utter despair in a sense that that we have to get out of here to anywhere. You know, on one level, you can say, why are the Lebanese not out on the streets when things are so bad right now? And I think, as Dr. Sayed said, it's partly because people are exhausted. It's partly because a lot of the people who, as, as John just said, who might have been driving these movements have now left. But maybe to end on a positive note, I have been surprised by conversations with younger people from the region who are much more optimistic than I would have expected about the legacy of the Arab Spring and have said, 
yes, it may be that Tunisia is not still the democracy that people hoped it would be, but that this idea that if it gets bad enough, you can overthrow it because that has already happened once. They've already done that once. And so maybe the seeds of change really have taken root in a way that is hard to see right now, but might manifest at any time going forward as opportunities arise. And one thing that is striking for those of us who are going back and forth to the Middle East for a long time is there are younger generations, they are really plugged in, they are following what's happening in the world, they are ambitious for themselves. Women see a whole set of life opportunities they never saw even a decade ago. And so, as Will says, there there are some people who say, you know, we're going to make this work. I worry about governments being ambitious enough to meet the expectations and the demands of a very large and young population that wants and expects more than what their parents got. And in some cases, the government has less at its disposal than they had when their parents were younger. And that's a challenge we're going to have to watch in the coming years. Thank you so much, John and Will, for joining me today. Marty, thanks for joining your first tabletop. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.